So Seamus, how have you been doing with video games this week? I've been playing very little video games. I've been doing my end of the year write up and, and trying to get the next retrospective off the ground. So I haven't played much. I played I played a game and then returned it today. That's what I did. Anything we're talking about? Is Wreckfest. It's like demolition derby racing game. I bought it and then I realized, you know what? I'm not that in the mood for a racing game. And also these loading screens suck. You know what? Never mind. I, I only played like 20 minutes. Mm. What have you been up to? Uh, well, I've been playing some Deep Rock Galactic. Uh, my brother and his wife got into it and uh, they're like, hey, you should play it with us a bit. And so, I was, yeah, I've been playing a little bit of that. Uh, it's a little bit weird where, it, so it's, it procedurally generates a map for you for the mission and you go down and you collect stuff and then you go back up and there's some variants on it, but that's the basic formula. And, uh, I ran one map and it was a pretty short map, but you're supposed to collect a certain amount of minerals is like 225 minerals or whatever. Um, and I missed like a little tiny chunk of like 17 minerals on the way down and, uh, couldn't complete the map because there's like exactly enough minerals to complete the mission. So I, I don't know how they have it tuned because I've run other maps where there's just like a, a huge surplus. So maybe it was just a, a weird glitch or, or like, you know, they've got it from absolute limit random number up to, you know, one and a half times or something. But it seems like there should be a little bit more margin on the on the lower end because that was very frustrating running back and forth through the whole map trying to find that one little tiny spot and it doesn't show up on your map. So like the people who plan the mission in 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 universe the people who plan this mission know how much resources there are because they set the quota so like they know it's there and if they know how much there is they should know where it is so if they know where it is why can't they put it on my map right <laughs> so it's a little frustrating but i've only run into that once i got deep rock galactic a few months ago my brother was really into it and he had a group of people that were playing it i got the game and then we were going to play that weekend, but then that weekend his group shifted and started playing Stellaris instead. So I never played. <laughs> no. Oh, man. I had picked it up some weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, and, uh, you know, played a little bit. And then my brother and his wife are now like way ahead of me because they've been playing a lot. And so I'm kind of, you know, being the third wheel on their, their fun times. But yeah, it's, it's a good time. I also updated Linux this week. Um, and unlike Windows Update, it's just like, hey, there's an update, and uh, you know, like, like, here's the list of all the things that are going to change when you update. And, you know, whenever you want to download is fine, and <laughs> whatever you want to install it's fine. No pressure. Here's what you're going to get. You into it? Right, exactly. And so I was like, okay, cool. I'll do it. Windows is like, you're updating now. And then after the update, you're like, well, what did you do to me? And it's like, eh, so maybe there was some security <laughs> something in there. The main well, more either that system. or it's like, you just installed Windows. Here's a tour. It's like, I don't want it. I didn't just. What are you doing? Who do you think I am? So, so you I was very yes. happy with the Linux process. I installed it and then it didn't give me a tour afterward. It was just like, you know what you signed up for. It's working. You know, go about your day. It it was so it was so seamless that like I had installed some software updates before the operating system upgrade. And the notification that the installation of the software updates was still there. Like it hadn't been cleared. So it was just like, wow, so seamless. I was, I was quite pleased. So it didn't reboot you. I did reboot. It, yeah. Yeah. It rebooted. But when I, when oh, it rebooted, it had the notification still. Amazing. I mean, it's still amazing. Someday Microsoft will figure out a way to give you an update and then tell you what was in it. I mean, I don't know. That sounds pretty advanced. Like, how would you even begin to write a feature like that? Maybe they'll need, like, some sort of learning algorithm or something to come up with that. A list of No things doubt they'll have to put it on the blockchain. And you'll have to do perform proof right. of work to get your change log. <laughs> <laughs> you'll need some distributing com distributed computing to, like, figure out what changed. We'll have to analyze it'll <laughs> decompile both versions and and do a compare do a diff 
Yeah. It's all just comments. It's all just like flame wars in the code comments. <laughs> no, the start button should be on the left. And then three days later, start button should be centered. And it's just back and forth. <laughs> Change every three <laughs> days. Well, what do you say we do? Okay, we have an absolutely ridiculous number of mailbag questions. Yeah, it looks like it's over 9,000. No, it's just over nine, actually. Like 10, I guess. Or nine. No, you're right, nine. I'm bad at numbers. So, um, let's do these. Dear Diecast, I hope you both are well. The idea of Christmas movies has been around for a while. Tiled, titles like Home Alone, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, and Die Hard are standard fare for <laughs> around y Yuletide. I was wondering, are there any games you would consider to be Christmas games? Happy holidays and best, wish best wishes for the new year. Vail Tim. Uh, yeah, I actually tried to do this. I tried to do this question in the spirit of this question. Like, what are the games that I play around Christmas? And I realized there aren't any. There were definitely movies you watch only around Christmas. Like, who watches Home Alone in August? Like, very few people sure. watch Home Alone or in August. It's a Wonderful Life, like, exclusively right. in December. Right. But there are no games that really land at the end of the year like that land at Christmas like that. So then I thought, you know, what games have been set at Christmas? And the only two I came up with, and I thought about this for a while, one was there used to be Christmas Lemmings, which I think was a free demo. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I seem to recall that one. And then the other one, uh, weirdly enough, uh, I'm doing commentary on it now, is Arkham Origins takes place in in Gotham right around Christmas and there's you know Christmas decorations up and snow everywhere hmm. so it's and that's I did not know that. the yeah that's the at one point Batman drops somebody into a Christmas tree from an incredible height that would definitely definitely kill him but it just you know cartoon physics he just like <laughs> he's gets bumped around not impaled on the the spike that is the tree right um yeah, so those are the only two that even, like, bring thoughts of Christmas to mind. I mean, Arkham Origins, not a very Christmassy game in message. It's just mostly, you know, there's no Christmas message. There's no Christmas theme. Nobody's celebrating Christmas in the game. It's just <laughs> background decoration. Mm -hmm. It's it's Christmas in the same... No, it's not even as Christmassy as Die Hard. In Die Hard... People are there for a Christmas party. and uh, Right. And there are Christmas-related quips that are delivered. Right. Like when they open up the vault and their hacker dude says, Merry Christmas, which is one of my favorite moments in the movie. Because <laughs> it, plays, it plays the schmaltzy Christmas music as the bad guys seem to win. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> so th those are the only two answers I came up with. Lemmings and Arkham Origins. Do you have anything for this? Well, both of the games I've been playing recently, Satisfactory and uh, Deep Rock Galactic, have a Christmas theme seasonal event thing that's happening, which kind of draws out the distinction between movies and games. Games are dynamic and, and can be, they can end differently. They can happen differently depending on when and, and where and, you know, updates and all that stuff. Whereas movies don't like they're they're static so uh I, I know there are a lot of games that have christmas events that happen in the game or that have you know seasonal stuff uh there'll be um fourth of july stuff sometimes and like war games or you know that kind of thing so right uh, i don't i don't know if you'd need to have a christmas themed game because it can just be a game for the whole year and it'll be Christmassy around Christmas time, right? It's as if you had That's like a wonderful point. life and then it's like, you know, it's Christmas themed around Christmas time and then you watch it in the summer and it's like 4th of July themed and, you know, right. it could be everything. That's true. I didn't think of that. I did not think of um, of MMOs and how they have holiday events. Yeah, World oh, of yeah. Warcraft. Yeah, World of Warcraft. I remember people would do that. I remember going into Goldshire once and there were a couple of half naked women i don't know if they were elf or humans but they were in santa girl outfit you know little santa girl outfits with short skirts and sexy stuff. santa 
sexy Santa outfits dancing on, you know, I forget what it was, like on a fence or on top of a mailbox or, you know, some a, other a thing. A fence that, pole. It's a pole right, dancing, really. Right. Some other thing that a normal person could not dance on top of. And it was, you know, <laughs> middle of summer. <laughs> you know, and they're in these Santa outfits. And, <clears throat> and it was just one of those, you know, welcome to Goldshire hmm. moments. Um, yeah. So that's a good point. Some games have Christmas events. Although Christmas events are like... It, some worlds can do that more easily than others. Like some worlds just don't have... You know, this is not a universe in which Jesus Christ existed. So, like, trying to put Christmas into it feels In both weird. Satisfactory and Deep Rock Galactic, they are not uh, Christ mass oriented. It's like presents and trees and tinsel and you know sphere ornaments because spheres are easy to model and, and render that kind of thing right right and there's some sort of like the you know they'll do the oh it's the winter solstice or whatever the thing yeah is. yeah i mean in, in satisfactory it's fixmas of course fixmas that's pretty good yeah it's not i mean it's tasteful yeah i haven't I haven't forgiven the game and I still hate it forever, but I'll admit that. So I, right. I, I kind of appreciate that there aren't any games about like Roman taxation and like traveling while pregnant. That's probably for the best. That is definitely for the best. That is definitely, oh yeah, lean into the secular side of it and not the religious side. That other way lies madness and people taking offense <laughs> and you having to explain yourself. Dear Diecast. Do you have any single-player games you really like where you play as an evil character? Games like Hitman and Mafia have you playing an anti-villain, doing bad things, trying to survive. There's a bunch of text here. I'm going to skip to the end. Can we make a relatable evil character, or are people too conditioned to be good boys and girls? Thanks, Will. Thank you, Will. I thank you, Will. No thank you. Um, so... I actually think there's quite a few good games where you get to play as the bad guy. Saints Row is probably the most obvious go-to example for everybody because you're the leader of a gang. Although Saints Row kind of, um, from the third onward, it kind of cheats because yes, you are definitely a villain running a criminal empire, but you're generally fighting somebody even worse. Mm. So you're, you're the hero of the status quo. There's uh, GTA, obviously. Right, and GTA is much less apologetic. It doesn't pretend that you're, you know, fighting some greater evil. It's just like, no, you're an amoral asshole stealing money you don't need in service of bosses you hate <laughs> to get revenge that you could get at any time. Whatever. Shut up. I watched a lot of Scorsese movies and I really like them. <laughs> so you're... <laughs> So here's my attempt at cobbling together our greatest hits of Scorsese scenes. Um, also, would you would you qualify would you allow that Strong Bad is a bad guy? Well, it's right in his name. I I mean that's pretty clear cut. Right. I mean he is the villain of Free Country USA. He is as villainous as that setting allows. He he's. So I guess he is the villain and, you know, he has his own series of adventure games and those are pretty great, but maybe that's not the kind of, you know, he doesn't do murders. <laughs> he's not, he's not actually the, he's not a bad guy in the, in the normal story sense, even though he is the worst person in the Homestar universe, he's not, um, He's not an evil villain in the sense of, you know, Ming the Merciless or Sauron. Right. He's almost like a children's TV show villain. Right. Right. Um, I actually liked the game Carrion, where you play is a horrible, like, 80s style science project gone wrong. Like this David Cronenberg monster that breaks out and eats everybody. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. liked that last year. And, and I liked Donut County, where you play as a hole that's trying to swallow a town. <laughs> that's not really... Okay, but in the spirit of the question here, like, he's saying, when you have an option, I think, is what he's saying. Like, if you can play a game two ways, 
and there's an evil path and a good path or whatever. Like, do you like to play the evil path? I know for myself, I don't. I I uh, yeah. intentionally don't do that because it it makes me feel bad, and I don't want to practice doing that. I even avoid playing games like Saints Row and, and uh, GTA just because it's like, I don't want to practice being that kind of a person. And it's just, I mean, that's my preference. So no, I don't play as an evil character. But uh, what do you think? So uh, the problem I have with that is that the games where you choose to play evil or you can choose to be good are always designed for the good players. You know, oh, you're here to save the day. Oh, but here, I'll let give you the evil option of being a dick about it. So it's either you could be a hero and save the universe, or you can be an evil dick that suffer, saves the universe for some reason. Or the evil dick that saves the universe and just complains about it all the, the whole way. And that's no fun. Like, the fun of being a villain is being outrageous. Yeah, what was that island simulator where you could be like a super villain on an island and you're setting traps for people or something? Oh, right. Uh, Evil Genius. Yeah. Evil Genius. And I loved the idea of that game. Oh, the idea of that game tickled my brain so much. But then the actual gameplay was just horrendous. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Glacially paced and tedious as all hell. Um, y Yeah, so there are very few games where you can choose to play as good or evil. The evil path always sucks. Mm. Because it's not... It's not what the story was intended to do. I feel like KOTOR did a decent job of it. Have you ever played Evil in KOTOR? Yeah, and I kind of felt like, yeah, that's probably the best, and it still felt like, it felt like you were on a ship with basically good people trying to save the Empire, and then at the end you can, like, take over yourself instead of, like, just destroying the bad guy thing. But it, it still felt weird. You never mm. got the feeling of being a Palpatine, you know, evil and loving it. Yeah, true. And uh, it's hard to imagine making a story that could suit either thing. Since, you know, unsurprisingly, the me the things you do to do good are different than the things you do to do evil. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's like, I'm going to start a soup kitchen for the poor. Well, I'm going to run an evil soup kitchen. It's like, you can't... <laughs> for the just evil poor <laughs> right <laughs> but so many that's that's what so many games are like mm, that's a good point greetings Seamus and Paul recently WoW Classic had a bit of a snafu in which people were able to transfer their geared vanilla characters from the classic servers to the new separate progression season of mastery servers I didn't know these servers existed, so I don't know how useful my answer is going to be here, but whatever. To put a long story short, someone transferred in a character with raid gear that wouldn't be accessible on one of these servers for the better part of a whole year. Needless to say, they went around causing havoc in battlegrounds and just destroying everyone effortlessly. While I'm no longer into WoW, this got me think about other times in history that silly exploits, exploits broke MMOs. Someone assassinating Lord British in Ultima Online, the in-game corrupted blood pandemic, and wow, all sorts of things like that. My question to you two is, what's your favorite example of these game-breaking exploits, if any? Starks. Jeez, I, I think you took the best ones there, Starks. <laughs> you did your research. Like, what else? What else is there? No, I mean, other than people, like, hacking the game and griefing people, which isn't really... I don't know. That's not really fun. Right. Right. Creatively using the... the Well, I, I guess my answer to this would be basically everything that's ever happened in EVE Online. It's not really an exploit. <laughs> it's game. just, hey, you're just playing the game. You know, oh, I decided to betray my corporation. I cleaned out their coffers, transferred all their assets into the enemy's hands, and then joined the enemy faction... And they made me, you know, a high ranking of, you know, I got to, I went from being a middle manager on my corporation to being, you know, a, an admiral on theirs. That's, that's a great story. I mean, it sucks if you're playing the game and that just like happens to you and you log in one day and everything you've built over the past several months is just gone. 
But if you're reading the story, that's just great. That's yeah. just a great twist. And that's not even an exploit. That's just that's just how it goes. The, the the game designers are just there like, don't hate the player, hate the game. But, you know, keep paying your monthly fee to play the game. I'm trying to think. Of, I, I'm not an expert by any means on MMO history, MMO archaeology. But uh, it, it seems like there was some kind of stuff that happened in uh, Dark Age of Camelot like that, where there was... There was like a three-way uh, PvP guild thing where you could, you know, like, or the servers or something could fight against each other. And so there was this... Yeah, yeah in Dark Age of Camelot, there were actually three three factions as opposed to two, like in WoW. In Dark Age of Camelot, one of them was, Cam was you know, King Arthur stuff. And another was like fairies, and I forget what the third one was. And they all fought was on like a big a battleground. like giants... Kind of like uh, Norse giants or something, ice ice guys. Huh. Well, they all fought each other in battlegrounds, which I always, you know, um, that's always a bit unstable to have a three-sided war. Mm -hmm. I seem to recall some of the guys in uh, when I was in college playing that, and they had this gig where they would log on at like two in the morning when no one else was on and like conquer all the forts or something. And then like the other right. guys would just conquer them back in the morning, but they would hold them all night and so that would give them some sort of advantage. Right, it was like you had to stand on the flag for, I don't know, a minute or something. And if nobody was around, then you could just claim it all and get whatever the reward was for doing that. All right. Dear Diecast, what are your favorite artillery games? Were you a Worms or a Scorched Earth household? Sincerely, Bobbert. For myself, we were a Scorched Earth household when I was growing up because we didn't know that Worms existed. Um, so... I played Worms back in the year 2000, maybe. Mm. And, you know, I just played against the CPU, and which that's not the real Worms experience. But I just, I don't do PvP. And if I do, <laughs> on the rare, incredibly exotic occasions when I do engage in PvP, it's always against strangers. I do not want to battle against people I know. Mm hmm um winning that's probably too a good policy really yeah winning means too much to me i hate losing and i get angry when i lose and when i'm playing against somebody i know then i lose both ways either i've caused them to be defeated or i've been defeated and so there's just no joy it's it's misery both ways yeah i remember there was a time when we were playing scorched earth and uh my brother and i he's four years younger than i am yeah, at the time, I was like, I don't know, 12 or something, so he's 8. And we're playing Scorched Earth, and, and so there's, like, this setup, you know, you're trying to lob your things over the mountain. And uh, I I played a lot, and I lined it all up, got lucky, and, like, first shot, lobbed it right over the mountain, you know, curved back around with the wind and hit him, and he dies. And he's like, I'm never playing this game with you ever again. And I was like, okay, that's probably, that's fair. It's over. Yeah. Uh, Worms dealt with that by each, t you know, if it was you versus one other person, you would each get, you know, uh, I forget how many, you'd each get four worms. So one lucky yeah. shot would let you take out somebody, but the game wouldn't be instantly over. Yeah. Yeah, we've, uh, since then, we had a Worms phase where we played Worms together. And it was a good time. It's it's certainly more of a game than Scorched Earth is. Scorched Earth is more of like a, almost like a tech demo. I think it's older by maybe five years or something yeah worms is pretty darn charming i mean i've never played it mm -hmm. the way you're supposed to play it against people but boy it just has tons of charm dear diecast so i have to say i find golf to be extremely boring best which is pablo oh wait wait, wait. i skipped too much on that one i'm not a sports guy in the first place but there's something about this particular one that i find relentlessly sleep inducing but I've realized that when golf is turned into a game mechanic for a different kind of game, I find it extremely satisfying. Two games come to mind as an example, What the Golf and the upcoming Curse to Golf, both of which use the mechanics of this game to solve physics-based puzzles. My question is, does this kind of thing happen to you? Is there some sort of game that you, that you don't enjoy when it's the full experience, but you do when it becomes a mechanic in a different style of game? Best wishes, Pablo. Uh, yeah, for me, it's fishing. I have no interest mm. in a game built around fishing, but I actually like when a game like, if it's a very hectic combat-oriented game, I actually like 
you know, oh, I need a breathe. I just need like two solid minutes of not explosions and flashing lights and just, you know, quiet. And I'll sit there and, you know, oh, look, a pool of water. Whip out your fishing pole, do a little fishing, and then you get on with your murders. I actually really like that. Hitman needs to add a fishing element. <laughs> fishing game in Hitman. Or just, oh, you know what? No, in Hitman, it should be a cooking game. Since you can always oh, like, yeah. just impersonate the chef and then just instead of killing your target, you just stay and work his shift. It turns into Kronk from The Emperor's New Groove. Have not seen. What? Out. When was The Emperor's New, New Groove? Was that in the 90s? We're going to get off on the Emperor's New Group tangent. I don't actually know. I, uh, I, think it was, I think it was in the aughts. Hmm, interesting that I missed it then. That would have been, right up, that would have been aimed right at my kids. Hmm, whatever. Hmm. It's a staple. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, I, I like when games have mini games in them, as long as they're not too far from the core of the game. But uh, I'm trying to think. Well, you know, like cleaning the house, like picking up stuff. That's no fun. But like Katamari is pretty fun. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I I just, I, I'm still stuck on this Hitman idea. Because there's like, <laughs> no. I just thought, Viscera cleanup detail. Not actually a funny game. It's a funny idea for a game. But playing the game mm. itself isn't that funny. Um, where you just you clean up, you mop up the blood after a first person shooter has happened. Right. And, uh, but I thought you put that in Hitman where you just like, okay, now I'm going to like get a mop bucket and clean up this murder. I just did. That would be, Oh yeah. Try to get the, all the evidence removed or whatever. Right. Right. Like you could, Oh, for one thing, I'm, I'm annoyed that, um, nobody notices blood. If you murder somebody and take the body away, nobody notices the bloody puddle, which I think is a terrible oversight given the level of fidelity of the rest of the game. But if you had to mop that up stuff the smells blood, too, that would... like it's not it's not a trivial deal to get rid of that stuff. Well, I didn't know that. I did not know that blood smells. It's asthma probably. Well, I mean, I have a horrible sense of smell. Just terrible. Still, that's so fast. All the things you could do in Hitman. Man. It's like all the all the people you knock out, you could probably make a case for actually doing their jobs. <laughs> make a mini game out of all those guys. Guard duty right. simulator. <laughs> you actually guard the place. You knock out a guard, take his place, and then keep other hitmen out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you keep the keep the guy who's allowed in there out of his own house. Like, oh, sir, you're not on the list. What? I own this place. Yeah, that's what everyone says. Ballet simulator. Window cleaner simulator? Does that exist? I'd be surprised if it didn't. It seems like it must, but I I don't know if I've seen it. I know there's power washing simulator, which I actually yes. I actually subscribe to a Reddit uh what do you call it? A subreddit. It's just it's called power washing porn. It's just somebody using high you just endless videos of people making something spotless using high powered water. And I find it incredibly um calming. Uh, I just love it. So that <laughs> they means... don't show all the videos of like someone power washing their house and just like stripping the paint right off it. No, no, that would probably get voted down. No, it's always like, oh, this is so gross. Look, these stones are like covered in gross dirt and like slime and they look horrible. And then poof, somebody comes through and blasts it and it's spotless. It looks like it was a newly built patio and you're like, oh, um, yeah, so then there's Power Washing Simulator. But as much as I like to watch those videos, I'll bet you Power Washing Simulator is boring as hell to play. <laughs> right, so but I never... if they made it into a mini game in Hitman... Right? <laughs> you, know, you can really mess somebody up with a power washer. Oh, that's true. Ooh. Dear Die Castles, Mark Brown of Game Maker's Toolkit has an ongoing series where he discusses the challenges and learning opportunities inherent in making a video game. As an indie game developer who shipped a game, does Seamus have any thoughts and observations thus far? Have you watched the series? Do you agree with his process? Best regards, Zeta Kai. So, um, I think he's going about it in the right way. I mean, his approach makes a lot of sense to me. Although it's not very interesting to follow. Like, okay, his approach is, 
I'm going to learn Unity, which obviously, if you want to make if you want to make a very standard game, if you're doing a very standard game type, Unity's the way to go. And you don't already have some knowledge, then Unity's the way to go. Um, you can go for Unreal, the Unreal Engine, if you like are really interested in AAA visuals. You can do non AAA visuals in Unreal Engine, but like that engine has a ton of overhead and is much slower to work with, and you know longer, longer compile times and things like that. Like if you're just doing a a lo-fi game, a simple game, then just do it in Unity. <clears throat> or like, Unity does um, have the option to do high quality graphics as well. Yes, it does. Um, although. If you if you know ahead of time, hey, I'm aiming for like triple A, like I want to make an open world city game or something, then really aim for Unreal Tournament or Unreal Engine. I don't know why I keep saying Unreal Tournament. Unreal aim for Unreal Engine. It will be much more performant. Unity really struggles at the when you go for the triple A looking stuff. Um, so Mark Brown is. Learning Unity, that is the, if you're doing something very obvious and default, that's the way to go. You know, and you don't already know some stuff, that's the way to go. That's that's where I send everybody. It's like, where do I get started? That's where you go. Um, and he's making a side-scrolling platformer, which is like, you know, baby's first video game. But that's a good place to start. Right. Um, so watching somebody make a side-scrolling platformer is not the most exciting thing in the world, but I think he's made sensible decisions all along the way so far. He, he His second video is all about, um, I don't think he says it explicitly, but really prototype your gameplay first. You know, yeah. some some people think of it as like, oh, you know, you need some art and some code and some gameplay and some interface, and it's like, no, these are not equal things on the org chart. The gameplay is right. foundation to all of the others. So start with gameplay. Have a, Just, you know, if you're making a side-scrolling side platformer, don't start with the art. Start with how does it feel? You know, have, have, have a rectangle running around on a bunch of rectangular platforms. Get that working so that it feels good. And then, you know, start making content and interface and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's really important to get your, your core gameplay loop refined early. Right. Otherwise, you might put months into making beautiful art for a, for a gameplay idea that fundamentally doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, and it's really easy to imagine that all... <sighs> It, uh, it's is the same with any discipline, right? Like if you don't know too much about art, it can you can just imagine like, oh, you just make something that looks good. And it's like, no, there's like an infinite number of things that are just garbage. And then there's that tiny sliver where it looks good. And it's, it's so, so hard to get there. It's the same thing with gameplay. Like there's an infinite number of game ideas that are just the worst. And like this tiny, this filament that you're trying to hit, you know, that, that is just right there on the edge between too trivial and too difficult and too boring and too repetitive and too novel. And it's just like, you have to balance so many things. Yep. The second half of this question asks me, have I ever thought about making a game and how am I going to deal with feature creep? And I will refer you to projectfledgling.com. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's Which too is feature me. creep personified. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all over. What if we made feature creep a full core part of our design? Yeah. Dear Die Castles, my son was replaying Super Metroid recently and we were discussing the reserve tank system. Okay, this one. Um I didn't know I, I think this brings up an interesting point, but I don't know how to answer this question specifically. I'm gonna skip all of this because I've never played Super Metroid and I have no idea how the super how the reserve tank system works or what it does or what these tanks are for so i like can't you, even I, intuit it from context have you played uh mega man x no i played 10 but no <laughs> no i no no I because i think it has I, a similar a lot of the mega man games have a similar system where you've got a health bar or whatever and then you've got the reserve tank that you can go into your menu and like draw from it but you have to remember to do it or you'll just die oh that does suck 
All right, let me let me jump to the second uh, paragraph here. Have either of you encountered a video game mechanic that was just there for its own sake, contributing little or nothing to the game as a whole? Have you ever played a game and thought, this just doesn't need to be here? And do you find that this is common even in games that are otherwise considered masterpieces, as Super Metroid is often regarded within its genre? Best regards, Zeta Kai. Um, I think there's a lot of that in... Um, Bethesda games. Mm. There's a lot of like, I don't know, Bethesda games, maybe that's a bad example. There's a lot of things that seem like a half feature where it's like you either yeah. needed to not put this in or you needed to put way more work into it. Yeah, I think it happens when you have a visionary work or a work that kind of is a breakout hit and people don't know why it succeeded. And so they just kind of adopt all of the features and they become these vestigial features that it's like they're here because it was part of what made the game great, I guess. Right. I'm trying to think of some other examples of um, systems that just didn't need to be there. I know I've encountered them. I know I've encountered them. I remember writing about them, but I can't remember them now. You wrote them down so you wouldn't have to remember them now. I can't think of it at its at the moment, but I I know it I know what you're talking about Zeta Kai, but none of them come to mind. Wasn't the uh, the crafting system in um, the new Tomb Raider games? Wasn't that kind of a weird like side thing? It's like why are we doing this? Why are we? Why can't you just? I don't remember the newest the newest Tomb Raider. I did not play all the way through Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I I bailed out like an hour in. I was so bored. Even though that's, I guess, the good one. It's the one everybody uses as a as a benchmarking demo now. <laughs> oh no. Um. Yeah. I, visually, I maybe know. the visually good one. Yeah. Um. Games where you've got to like craft arrows, but it doesn't add it. But like the stuff <laughs> to craft arrows is free. So yeah, yeah. That that um. I think that was Tomb Raider. I'm thinking of a game where the resources to craft ammunition is so plentiful that you never run out it's just it forces you to open up the menu which pauses the game and costs you nothing and click on the uh, make me more ammo button several times and then you go back to shooting and it's like well what was that for what did that add <laughs> what to the game? she's just like pause time out time out everybody gonna do some fletching here right was that am i thinking of the last of us or Tomb Raider. I can't remember which. One of those two. It was some game where you always had so many resources. You were always drowning in resources, but you had to stop sometimes in the middle of combat to turn those resources into bullets. And it was dumb. Health potions in Fable. Why are they there? Okay. Health potions in Fable. I don't remember. How did that work? So you could they were pretty inexpensive you could craft them and you could also buy them and by the end of the game you could just had like a hundred in your inventory and you could use them at any time and you can just like spam them to to like regenerate your health and they give you back like half your health each or whatever so like during boss battles you're just like you know clicking that health potion button all the time you don't have to worry about dying because you just you can't die oh weird yeah it seems like i mean the the solution for that is a cool down Mm -hmm. on drinking a potion it doesn't even need to be that long just 10 15 seconds just so the player can't become immortal by just endlessly <laughs> chugging or even like a like a overdose mechanic right where you can like chug health potions but after a certain point you get like health potion poisoning or something and then you start losing health instead of gaining health so you have to kind of keep track of it you can't just mindlessly you know knock them down yeah knock them back whatever the phrase is um yeah, and I I think um, the I know Diablo two is a classic, but I always thought its belt mechanic was just awful. The way you would load potions onto your belt, and so you needed better and better belts to get more and more potions on your belt, and it just <laughs> always and so it was a lot of interface clicking around, and you're you know you're fighting a boss, so you need to like open up your inventory. And then transfer a bunch of more stuff to your belt. And it wasn't it wasn't useless in the same way that these other things were useless, but it was definitely not optimal. It was definitely that's the one thing Diablo 3 improved on, is that it put your health potions on a cooldown 
rather than just like, well, you can only have so many on your belt, because that was just dumb. Skeletons and zombies in Minecraft. They're not really part of the setting. They don't play into the game's mechanics. I think they're just kind of, they were a prototyping feature that was in there at the beginning, and they never got taken out. Skeletons and zombies, whoa. I always thought creepers were the least interesting foe. Although they are the more iconic. Right, I mean, they, they, they interact with the game's mechanics. And like uh, the silverfish were a great addition because they interact with the mining mechanic. Like you're digging and then it creates foes from you digging so you don't encounter them if you're not mining. It's, it's, it's good. I mean, they could have done more with it. I feel like there's a lot of optimizations that could be made to Minecraft that just, it's doing so well that nobody wants to change anything for fear of breaking it. Right. Oh yeah, Microsoft, since they bought it, have been so ridiculously... I mean, how many years has it been since they bought it? And it feels like they've done maybe, you know, six months worth of... The, the improvements they've done in the last several years feel like what you might do in six months. Like, just all yeah. very, very timid, very incremental changes. Although I think the problem started earlier on when Notch was developing it. He kind of became a victim of his own success where he was playing around at the beginning and then it became this, you know, incredible success. And he was like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to touch it, right? I'm afraid to touch it anymore. I don't know if that's right. true or not, but it seemed like development slowed way down even before he sold it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, in the early stages, there's just crazy stuff being added all the time. And then once it took off, everybody's really shy about making changes to it like adding a new foe to the game is a big deal now and we need to have a conversation with the community and play test and prototype and get feedback and it wouldn't be a problem if you had a modding interface minecraft right <laughs> dear diecast by the law of the rule of three i suppose this is the last time that i may use the same source of inspiration to throw a question in your way Unless you say otherwise. Yes, another design doc video compels me to ask your thoughts on making some video game related video. What do you think makes a good slash bad level up system? Kind regards, Andrew. And there's a link to the design doc video in question. All right. I have some thoughts on this. I think the, the killer feature of a level up system is one which enables the game to to gradually increase complexity you don't want to start the game and you've got 10 different superpowers 10 different abilities that you can use in any given moment and they all have special use cases and they each have their own energy that you have to feed and it's just too much to explain all that to a brand new player hmm. so a brand new player you start the game with just swing your sword and then when you level up it's like hey now you can spend a skill point and you can get one more piece of complexity. You know, you can get a fireball spell and now you learn when to use a fireball and how to manage the resource that it's key to, you know, mana or whatever. Hmm, yeah. And you get to decide where the complexity is added. So it's not just like, here's the new thing. It's like, what are you, what are you interested? Right. I think that's a great way to, to manage a fundamentally complex game and to allow the player to explore parts of it that they think are interesting. A terrible level up system is like the meta progression systems that you get in um, like online games or yeah, or like Fortnite where it's like you, you shot 50 people and you picked up 12 guns. So now you have another level and you get a loot crate or something just awful awful that doesn't exist for a reason it's not like it's adding complexity when you level up it's just dribbling out rewards in a slow drip to make you want to put in money to make the drip go faster it's terrible mm. or like the level up systems where you have auto leveling enemies where you level up but now the enemies are all harder so what really happened was you got a all your equipment got worse essentially you have to go get new yes. equipment now Oh, yeah. Oh, th yes, that is the worst. The auto-leveling enemies. The auto balance. Looking at you, Oblivion. Is, yes. Terrible makes me angry. So, yeah, leveling systems that let you slowly increase the complexity of the game, 
pretty darn good though. And I love it when there's an option to, instead of adding an active ability where you have to manage complexity, just add a passive, a passive thing that yeah. makes the game a little bit easier. Where if you're like, eh, I'm comfortable with the complexity right now. I don't want it to get more crazy. Just, you know, make me make it a little easier for me so I can, you know, go through the zones a little faster or whatever. Oh, I can run a little faster or I'll very gradually regenerate health so I don't need to burn a health potion after a battle. By the time I run to the next battle, my health will be back up. That's a nice mm -hmm. convenience feature. Good passive, you know, it's the, the, the heal, the, the regen isn't fast enough to help you out in battle or it only works outside of battle. That's a good passive ability. Mm. Yeah, yeah, those are good. Like, I feel very... like um, what uh, Risk of Rain did this it kind of like the inverse. It did like the worst of both worlds where it, it's got items that add complexity, but then you also can't choose which ones you get. And so it's like as you go through the game, you're just kind of like careening through this pinball machine of, of mechanics. Um, I'm having trouble. Oh, like the pickups that you get that give you special abilities. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's like the whole thing of your leveling, right? Like you don't really get that much more right. powerful leveling up. It's all your items that you get. Right. And you don't know what they're giving you, especially at the beginning. So it's more complexity and it's more unexplained complexity. And all the enemies keep getting harder as it goes on. So it's not even that it's auto leveling. It's like time limit leveling enemies. So they're getting more powerful whether you get powerful or not. Yeah. Now the fun of that is once you learn the game well enough, you can you can grow in power faster than the enemies. And then you can just mm. break the game. And I love that it lets you break the game. Like you can literally, you know, get so powerful you just fire your weapon once and you kill everything on the screen. And the, the designers do not see that as a problem. It's like, no, you... You got the right items, you spent things, you moved fast enough, you invested the time and learned the mechanics well enough to make that possible. That's your reward. I right. actually really working like as that. intended. Right. I actually really like that, but yeah, it does have the downside of that of at the beginning you have no idea what you're getting or doing or what any of it means and that's like one of those games that you really kind of need to read the wiki to really appreciate it. And that's not great. Yeah. My kids tried to play Risk of Rain 2, and they're just like, this game is too hard. I was like, well, it's not an, it's not a simple, like, it's not an inviting, simple experience. Like, it's a, it's a very, um, you need a refined taste to enjoy Risk of Rain. Right. I like Risk of Rain 2 much better than the original. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. But it is one of those, like, oh, this is so hard until you, like, until you sort of by brute force learn what all the items do and you learn that you need to stack similar items and that's how you break the game and mm. then you need to have and then you need to have enough like oh i've already got a bunch of those i should get more of those well, you know, and also the learning the levels like the levels don't change that much so you can kind of learn what the layout right. is and it, traversal and all that stuff it's 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 not as easy as it looks yeah with the timer running all the time being able to know like, what's the fastest way? Okay, I got all the stuff I can get. Now I need to get out of here as quickly as possible and not waste time yeah. wandering around. Yeah, and where the break-even point is, it's like, okay, I need to get these three items on this level before I move on or, or whatever it is. Right. How, what's the optimal number of... Because you can stay and get those last few items on this level, but boy, that's going to take you some time and that might not be worth it the, the the enemies will get much stronger while you're waiting for that and it's not worth it so mm. yeah learning you know how many things do i need before i move on i really enjoyed getting i think it was two hoopo feathers that allow you to air jump and so then you could double air jump and get up like outside the game area and they don't have well they might have some but i don't i don't think there are very many um invisible walls you know clipping planes and so you can just like jump up on top of the map and enemies don't spawn up there. And so then you can just like run out the timer and just hang out. And it's like, I'm, I've been here for an hour and a half and, you know, taking pot shots at these almost invincible enemies down there. Right. I love the game that the game doesn't like, oh, that's an exploit. We need to fix it. It's like, no, that's the mechanics. You can do that if you want. Mm. All right. Um, since this is our Christmas show, it's a perfect question. It's about vampires. Oh, yes. The most Christmassy of monsters. 
Dear DieCast, I have a bit of an unusual question this week. How do you think society and its systems would change if vampires, that burn up in sunlight and have an insatiable appetite for blood, succeed in turning everyone into one? How might they adapt? Could they adapt? And how long might that new nocturnal society last? Cheers, Andrew. I think it's funny that this came up. You and I, not on the show, but off off the show, you and I discussed... Um... Oh, I don't want to spoil it. I don't uh -huh. want to spoil there... it. Stopped yourself just in time. Yeah, yeah. There was a show that eventually led to vampires, but you didn't know it. It was it was a Netflix show that um, gave no hint what it was really about, and so then it goes. Spoilers into vampires. for episode nine of Star Wars. <laughs> anyway, you and I offline talked about that and all the all the properties of those vampires. Yeah, so it really does hinge on. How exactly do these vampires, what kind of vampires are these? If they're like original flavored, uh, good old Bram Stoker vampires that are like repelled by the sacraments and uh, are actually supernaturally, uh, you know, they live forever whether they drink blood or not, then like, yeah, you could just have like, they could just live forever whether or not they have blood to eat. If they're more like, uh, vampire bats, I guess, which do technically drink blood, although I don't think they subsist on blood. But anyway, like, if they're actually eating blood, then the question is, well, why couldn't they eat just, like, animal blood? Um, and, you know, that would should be fine. Right. Uh, I always thought they had, it had to be human blood, because otherwise, why would you, why would you ever go to the time and trouble of feeding on a human being? Oh my goodness, human beings are friggin' dangerous. They have relatives, and they carry guns, and they have phones that they can use to call the police. That is just, if you suck blood from a dog, it's not going to call the dog police on you. It's just, right. you get the dog's blood, and you get on with your night. Yeah, the dog would probably even be happy about it. What? Why? Because they're so friendly, and you know, they just love to have people around. There's like, oh, you're cuddling up to me. Oh, it's so good times. <laughs> right. So, my understand, my immediate assumption here is that society, if if vampires had to feed on blood, and you, they successfully turn everybody into vampires, then they die. They 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 just extinction go extinct. level event for vampires. Yeah. Right. And in fact, it wouldn't get there because it would get harder. As you get past the tipping point, whatever it is, like, you, you know, you have to think of it like a food chain. Prey has to outnumber the predators for its food chain to work. And there's hmm. some magic number, like how many wool, how many rabbits do you need for every wolf? Yeah, I think it's a 10 to 1 body mass thing uh, is like just about as steep as it can get. Right. So that would be, you know, once you get so that more than 10% of the population is vampires, then there would not be enough blood for the vampires and they would begin suffering whatever the problem is that makes them, you know, what What do they starve? They, they die. Go insane. Right. It depends. Some of them have them become like, uh, what was the movie with Ethan Hawke? They would just be regular people that needed to drink blood but if they didn't get enough blood, then they would become more and more horrible and leathery and bigger and bigger teeth and more bat-like until they turned into mm -hmm. basically monsters um, from lack of blood. So, I don't know. It seems like really, you know, vampire movies, I, I like the ones where the vampires put some thought into it. Because, like, the, the hanging out in alleyways waiting to suck blood from, from passing peasant women is a sucker's game that gets you a snake mm -hmm. through the heart every friggin' time there's just no way that you win at that game the good thing to do is just run a blood bank and skim yeah <laughs> i mean that's, that's yeah although that's the game. that kind of again it, the question comes up like what exactly is it about human blood that that drives these vampires in the original one it was like this supernatural thing where you had to be feeding on a I think it even was like, it has to be a woman, she has to be a virgin, there's all these, you know, like, it's it's a very, there's a lot of subtext there, but, like, you know, taking blood from a food right. bank just wouldn't work in that scenario. It's not right thematically appropriate or whatever. So, like, it's kind of a weird thing of, like, vampires that burn up in sunlight and need to drink 
quote, human, unquote, blood or, or whatever. We're assuming human blood, right? Like, why do they need to do that is, is a really important question to answer. Right. Because if there's some nourishment that they're not getting from from food, like, can they digest food? They have... They're, they're, they used to be humans. They've got the equipment. They've got, got human, a digestive yeah, teeth. tract. Right. You yeah, yeah. Drink teeth. some pig blood and take a multivitamin. <laughs> right. It's, just, it's a bucket of fried chicken. What is not? What is it that you need that isn't in this bucket of fried chicken? <laughs> and uh, and whatever that is could probably be solved with, like you said, a multivitamin or some medicine. You know, like that vampires would be a problem for the ancient world, but you're in the modern world. It would just be... And just be conditioned. You just have to make sure that your insurance covers it. Mm. So how would society change? It would just, it would just, before vampires became so common that, that the whole ecosystem collapsed, there would have to be some balance. Yeah, normally how it works with predators is the predators turn on each other when there isn't enough prey around and that limits the population of predators and you know everything balances out so and you see that in vampire movies right there's this you know the aristocratic vampires that keep an eye on all the lower level vampires or whatever and they've got them well organized and you know make sure that they're not taking too much blood and they're not drawing too much attention and all that kind of thing right and they start and if things get short the the lower vampires will say well what do we need these guys for and just kill them we'll take over and uh that would even the numbers and that that could continue as long as it needs to until it evens back up mm. and um if that was true that they could only feed on the blood of virgins do you realize the change in behavior that would create yeah all of a sudden everybody would be trying to get rid of their virginity as soon as possible oh i was thinking that the vampires would like you know the aristocratic vampires would just like take tinder down oh yeah either way that seems like a pro like that seems like an easy problem to solve is just like get rid of your virginity and then they won't want your blood anymore. And yeah, that's a whole thing. Like, how does that even work? It couldn't happen in the modern world. <laughs> totally, you hate these unrealistic vampire stories. All right. Well, that was a lot of great questions and one really weird one for our Christmas episode. Yeah, we did have a, a Christmas question. So we started off right anyway. Where did it all go wrong? It went wrong with vampires, Paul. Although it is an interesting question. I want to talk about this show. I, w I, w I want to like talk about it with people on my site, but you can't talk about it without spoiling it. Like the whole fact that it's not a, that you don't even know you're watching a vampire show is part of the appeal. Mm. Mm. You know, really, you, you just need like uh, somewhere where you can go and discuss things with people in your community, but like, on a side channel, like a uh, forums or something. Damn it, Paul. I just got a notification today from my ISP. It's like, hey, do you know your your version of the bulletin board software is like super old, not of date? You should update that. I'm like, it's broken. It doesn't work anyway. <laughs> oh, feels bad, man. All right. Well, thanks so much to everybody who sent in questions. This was our last show of 2021. We're taking the next couple of weeks off, so the next time we come back, it's going to be 2022. Thank you for all the great questions this year. Thank you to everybody who's been listening. Um, if you've got a question for the show, of course, we're not going to get to it until next year. But if you want to ask it, it's our email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Say Merry Christmas, Paul. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. That too.